Good morning. Good morning. The Board of Supervisors of the County of Delaware County and the governing body of all other special assessment and taxing districts for which said board so acts is now meeting in regular session. If you would join me for a moment of reflection. Thank you. And if uh, you would, Supervisor Howard will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you very much. Do we have an uh, introduction of any new employees today? None today, Vice Chair. Thank you. And as we had no closed session today, we don't have any report of actions. Um, are there any uh, deletions, corrections, or additions from any of the board members to the agenda? No, not yet. Okay. Um, We'll move on to receiving brief reports and announcements um, relative to the county. And we'll start with Supervisor Maston. Hey, good morning. Well, I don't know if many of you knew, but I did catch COVID right after the weekend after our last board meeting, which was terrible timing because I was in an election, but uh, it, um, kept me down for a little while and I'm still recovering with some energy issues but uh, so I appreciate anyone who encounters that experience and um, hoping that people are, are cautious and careful as they move forward for their health. So I did tour the homeless camps in my district um, after our uh, board meeting um, last time and I knew that we had an, uh, a problem um, I had no idea to the magnitude of uh, the problem. And of course, um, they all lie within my district. So um, I know that a lot of people find that as a controversial issue and some don't want to talk about it. Some want to ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. But I've had some reminders. It's, it's double fold because I've had um, people who live next door to the Ruth camp who um, are concerned because um, they have individuals who go by uh, threatening them, saying, I'm gonna kill you on a regular basis. And, um, and these are tax paying uh, residents who um, live with this day in and day out for the impacts. And, and that's not okay from that side. It's also not okay for uh, people to live in the conditions that they do within the homeless camps. And it's not okay that the environment is taking a hit at the same time. And so um, it is on my radar at a much higher level than it was before I did the tour um, to the encampments. But it's very clear too for the drug use um, um, in certain camps. It's very evident it's a different camp. And these are little villages. So anyone who does come to the area is gonna be drawn to those villages to stay and so we do need to take a, a more serious look about what's occurring in our neighborhoods um, and it's 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 not somewhere remotely it's within um, the places that we live and um, so that is one I had planned to take a tour um, that Friday to Rogue Valley to see what they've done because they have a well thought out um, effort to deal with the homeless in that area. Um, and I wasn't able to do that, but I do plan to uh, go there because I am thoroughly impressed by the research that I've done with how they are handling the homeless issues in their area. It's a very comprehensive and, um, and very uh, well thought out. So I'm excited about that opportunity to learn more. I did meet with the roads department because as I was knocking on doors, it's quite evident there are some serious needs and especially in Birch Track. Um, and 
Um, so I was extremely concerned about how and we address those issues and also with some drainage issues for groundwater in that neighborhood too. So um, what I did find out, which was very disheartening, is that the particular roads that are need the greatest um, attention are not on the county road system. And that has a lot to do with the developer and not meeting certain requirements in order to be able to um, turn those roads over to the county. So that's going to be more challenging for how we address that in the, in the long term, but it uh, is something that I, um, I believe we need to do simply because we, it is evident of how your community is with how your community <laughs> infrastructure is for um, its development and just the, the pride in neighborhood. So I will continue to look at how we um, find creative ways to find solutions to address that issue but also to do a drainage survey that's uh, desperately needed because of the groundwater and um, then when it rains, the additional water that comes into the area that floods those residents that live um, over uh, towards the Roy um, Street there. Um, there's, two, there's a huge problem. So I am going to be trying to identify where we might find funds to um, do that survey so that we can develop some sort of plan for that area in the long term. I did meet with some business owners and, um, and Jerry Cochran because he uh, sits on the Golden Gate Bridge and there is a business partner in the Bay Area who wants to in, uh, increase tourism in, in the area and it was with a couple other business people which could offer some uh, wonderful opportunities. But um, to follow up with that, which fits very well, is I had a meeting with the state and national parks um, and um, to discuss enhancing tourism in Delmont County. So I'm looking forward to um, hosting a meeting uh, June 30th that will involve um, city, county, visitor bureau, chamber, school district, and others um, to look at how we might take advantage of some of um, the new Titans Grove that's there and the increased activity that it will occur because of that. They're anticipating that it's going to be a uh, number one destination, so there's a lot of opportunities there. So I'm excited to see where that will go for us. And um, I set up a meeting between the unions and the local tribes as they want to look for um, job opportunities and contract opportunities with the removal of the dam so that they can begin to have discussions with them for training and internships. And so that was a very productive, including some discussion about forming a local um, training center. So that could fit into this bigger plan of things also. Um, so I'm excited about that. So that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Nelson. Supervisor Starkey. Yes, thank you. Um, since our last time that we met, I attended the Memorial Day event at the Veterans uh, Cemetery. Um, it's a great but surreal event that, that occurs every year. Um, and the visions of the flags that are flying on the grave sites is something that takes your breath away as well as the, the gun salute that they do. Um, so I'm very happy that I was able to attend that. I met with Dr. Codwell about partnering with some mental health services, some issues that we have. As you're aware, you know, Delmar County has a lot of mental health issues and we're always looking for that all hands on deck approach. How can we address this as a community? So we're pulling in every single partner and Dr. Codwell represents the healthcare district so um, I'm wanting to figure out ways to pull him in and his resources. I went to Trinity County and attended their ribbon cutting for their new jail. <sighs> they got a brand new jail. We need a brand new jail. So um, I wanted to just represent Del Norte County in that event to see if I couldn't uh, find some time to talk with their new sheriff or their sheriff, Tim Saxon, and see what steps they took in order to get that brand new jail. So luckily we got some connections. We're gonna see if we can't start some, some conversations here locally about how we perhaps can get that done for us here. I attended the Lucky Seven Comedy Show uh, with the Chamber of Commerce Board. That was a nice treat. 
Um, I met with some Fort Dick constituents regarding alternatives to filing charges on the dog owners that have been kind of terrorizing that neighborhood. I think we landed on a pretty good compromise and that we're going to be fining those dog owners every time that they are out so that their fines are going to stack up and that hopefully will in be um, incentive for them to figure out ways to keep their dogs contained. Uh, I judged at the Singing with the Stars event. Uh, it's a fundraiser for the Humane Society and that was always a delight to watch some of our local talent. Um, I'm just going to tell you that um, Officer Luna from the CHP, I'm never going to quite look at that man the same. He and his daughters pulled off the best version of Beyonce's Say My Name. Um, and I, I'm already working on if I ever get pulled over by Officer Luna uh, replicating his, some of his moves. Um, I participated in a prom dress giveaway. Um, we have this thing called the Fairy Godmothers and it is our last year, but we were able to give away 50 dresses to two individuals who need that. Um, and so we're going to be passing that baton off to the school district and they're going to be taking uh, that giveaway o over. Um, I did attend a meeting with the Del Norte uh, Unified School District on mental health services. Um, it's, it's time that we start getting really upstream and looking at some of these mental health issues that are developing in childhood and how we can get a handle on those. And so uh, meeting with the school district and having hearing their ideas on how we can get that done is something that um, I'm extremely interested in. I attended the visitor bureau meeting um, we're continuing to gain attention, like Supervisor Mastin said, about different um, areas of interest that we have here. We draw those visitors in. We're getting written up in a lot of different news articles. Um, I continue to co-chair the 4th of July festivities. Um, and really just a shout out to the chamber, Cindy Vosberg and Luann Epperson. They're the ones doing the work, but they allow me to call myself a co-chair, so it makes it look like I'm doing the work. Um, we did announce the hometown heroes. There are 12 hometown heroes that are well-deserving individuals in this community. And I attended the local behavioral health board meeting. And the best part that came out of that meeting, sadly, was a discussion about suicide and just how raw and vulnerable people's stories are. People that sat on that board with us have the same stories that we're hearing all around. And how can we use that data and try and prevent future suicides? So we have on our agenda item today, the after hours service call. That is something that is extremely important in this community. Um, six months for the last quarter, or not, it's not a quarter if it's six months, but in the last six month reporting, there was 520 total after, after hour service calls. That's 520 people who got to talk to a real person. So that's a very vital service that we have in this community and I'm glad to see it is on the uh, consent calendar today for approval. And that is my report. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Starkey. Supervisor Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Turn my mics up here. <coughs> it's been a busy couple weeks since our last board meeting and a lot of it kicked off with the North Deal meeting, which is a meeting of the local transportation agencies out of Eureka. They're still meeting by Zoom, which is nice, but I wanted to update on a couple of the projects that are undertaken here south of us, in particular the Hunter Creek Panther Complex, which is at the Hunter Creek Bridge. There's a scheduled uh, to return to normal at that, at that spot in February 2023, so they're working quickly to get that finished up. Also want to update on the Cushing Creek project, which is just up from uh, Crescent City Hill. That's a brand new stoplight just past the Hamilton Road area in the turns and the windies. Scheduled completion October 2022. And then last chance grade. I know we're all looking forward to this. No controlled traffic by this winter 2022. So it'll be nice to finally get that project back on the road and really focus in on what's needed, which is a bypass to that intersection. Um, Caltrans has been working now quite extensively on Highway 199 and a safety audit which the Del Norte Local Transportation Commission has been driving some focus on as our collision and accident rates continues to be quite high in that 199 corridor. Um, not sure how it's gonna 
uh, transfer into projects, but it will allow us to focus on some of the more dangerous locations on that highway where, where there is loss of life and loss of property. And then uh, finally, uh, moving forward still with the turn pockets at um, the Dollar General Timbers Boulevard location on Highway 101, and then also doing a full corridor study at the intersections between Dr. Fine Bridge and uh, Rowdy Creek to see if there's any additional turn boxes that will be necessary in those locations. Obviously with the tourist traffic increase, we're still seeing a tremendous amount of skid marks on the highway, which means that we're some damn close near misses in these locations where people could have gotten rear-ended. So a lot of focus going on there by Caltrans and we're making sure they pay attention to all these locations in Delaware County. Um, had a Board Coast Regional Airport Authority meeting where we approved the budget. It's on our agenda here today. And then also um, had a meeting of, uh, with our UC Cooperative Extension folks and we're very close to doing interviews this Friday with six candidates that are applying for an economic development position with the UC Cooperative Extension which will be located here in Donor County. Final, final interviews will be uh, July 8th. In addition, um, attended the Senior Center meeting, also a meeting of the Tri-Agency, um, a meeting with the Talawadini Nation, and uh, a meeting of the Natural Resource uh, um, Goals Committee, and then also a meeting with Congressman Huffman, Congressman Thompson, and other congressmen like LaMalfa to dis continue discussions around wildfire on our public lands and attended a Donor Local Transportation Commission meeting where uh, Chair Short was there at the time. And then also a meeting that we had with uh, Randy Hooper and the Public Communications Government uh, lead for Charter Communications, Lisa uh, Vodushi. And she's really looking to fill the gaps in broadband connectivity within rural Delnor County. We've done an incredible job with connectivity here in Delnor County long time before the state even got engaged with broadband. Delnor County was able to get both redundancy and bandwidth, but there's still pockets like in Klamath that are desperately needing broadband. W one thing I was shocked about, however, in the conversation is that the they tried working very closely with the Yurok tribe to um, push uh, a broadband connectivity piece forward, and the Yurok had decided to take their own path with developing their own utility around broadband. So. Um, Supervisor Mastin, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that and possibly revisiting that with Tribal Council to see if there's still a path forward for that utility or if there's a way we could speed up connectivity down there for the Klamath area. And then uh, again, the Memorial Day events, as Supervisor Starkey mentioned, both at the cemetery and the Point of Honor were extremely well done and very happy to see such a large turnout for our veterans. And finally, just want to thank uh, most importantly, District 3 and the support I received in this year's election. It was a hard-fought race. Really appreciated the, the participation by two others challenging for the District 3 seat. And it was a well-fought race. More importantly, great communication and incredible turnout by District 3. Folks were engaged and very proud of that. And I uh, want to thank both of those that ran for the seat for stepping out and being willing to take that challenge on for this community because we do deserve the best here. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. Um, rather than give a report on my doings in the past couple of weeks, I wanted to just give some kudos. Um, Memorial Day weekend, I was able to go over to College of the Siskiyous and watch one of our local boys, Michael Weiland, walk across the stage, put himself through the fire academy there. Um, I've watched this little guy grow up since he was little. I'm super proud of him for, for doing that. And he's on his way to a professional firefighting career. Um, so just wanted to say I was proud of Mike for, for doing that. Um, also, we've had a couple of uh, incidents that I think are worth mentioning. Um, towards the end of last month, there was uh, a man <clears throat> out in our rural area that uh, had a recent uh, vascular surgery on his leg and I don't know if he fell or what the problem was but he managed to tear that vascular section loose and was bleeding profusely and there was no no way that um, you know ambulance or 
fire could get to him with the amount of blood that he was losing. So I want to give kudos to Jason Borges. Uh, he works for the city over here in the courtyard, and uh, he's a brother of Joey. And uh, had he not gotten there quickly, put a tourniquet on this guy's leg, it's, it's um, probably most certain that the man wouldn't be with us today. So really wanted to give uh, Jason kudos for that. He's a he's an EMT and a volunteer fireman, and you know that's kind of one of the great things about our um, uh, emergency responder network that we have in this county is you never you never know who's next door to you that can that can help. And and Jason was there and and likely saved this man's life. <clears throat> Lastly, I wanted to give kudos to um, a couple of members of our DHHS, our APS folks, um, Lenora Wallace and Terry Scott. Um, yesterday, they decided to uh, just randomly go check on a guy and found him in really, really bad shape. And, and I just, some, some people may think that, yeah, they were just doing their jobs, but I, th I think the, the attentive, attentiveness that they give to their job um, kind of needs some recognition. Um, they were able to call emergency services, and this guy was in bad shape. And had they not checked on him yesterday, um, who knows what kind of shape he would be in today. So Lenora and Terry, I definitely appreciate your uh, Reynolds here. <laughs> they, should, um, they, they did great yesterday. So just wanted to say I appreciate them. So with that, that's the end of what I have to say. So we will move on to the consent agenda. Do we have any items? Mr. Yes. Ch Chairman, um, I'd move to approve the consent agenda uh, items, but I'd like to pull item 14 for discussion. Okay. And then in addition, actually, I got lost. Where is it on here? The CD. Uh, 19, please. 14 and 19. Yep. Thank you, Supervisor Howard. And Supervisor Mastin? I'll second that, but I would like to pull item number five. Very good. Supervisor Starkey, anything for you? I have nothing to pull. <laughs> Very good. Um, I did have concerns with item number three, but I was glad to um, get the answers I needed from um, Tony Self upstairs. Um, I was concerned that the, that the county, um, as a part of that memorandum, uh, could possibly be um, at risk for um, assuming any, any debt that could come from that program. But I was assured from Tony that, that the city, as part of this MOU, is just asking to operate in the county. And the county will have no, uh, no liability there. Um, so, um, is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Vice Chair, I have online. You do? Yeah. Go ahead. Brandon, you are on. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Chairman and Board of Supervisors. Uh, you guys have a history of approving 100% of the agenda items, so I'm not sure why I'm going to waste my breath on your deaf ears, but um, I'm not sure what reality we live in where things get approved 100% of the time. Uh, abusing the consent agenda, uh, today DHHS and social services dominate the county's expenditures. Uh, it's also leading the abuse of the approval in these consent agenda items. 10 to 21 consent items today are for DHHS. And over the past 10 years, as we've seen, the correlation of the county's funds and investments in DHHS, we see the subsequent crime and homelessness and substance abuse problems have been exploding in our community, crisis levels. And what point 
do consent agenda items get discussed? Is it $18,000 for line item number 17? That's not the $44,000 for line item number 20? I mean, if you guys don't have a question about $136,000 for line item 18 that provides a service that really isn't necessary and amends a time nearly three times the original amount, I mean, that's not a proper amendment. It should be a new contract. You know, to talk about the $200,000 given to Del Norte Mission Possible to upgrade our daily bread ministries. You don't talk about the failed home key project agreement that was illegitimately formed. The agreement should be terminated. It has an undetermined price tag, and yet you don't talk about it. And most pathetically, you don't talk about the $2.5 million to further victimize the youth in our community on line item number 14. This board's unquenchable appetite to expand government and create social service dependence is victimizing our community's youth. The constitutional infringement this board has imposed are the direct cause of the mental illness suffered by the youth in our community. Brandon, wrap it up, please. If you are honest in preserving our children's safety, you would reinsert God family back in spending our tax dollars to promote. Thank you, Brandon. Is there any other public comment for consent to gentlemen? Please. Allergies are really bad. So number 18, the legacy. Um, I, I guess I have a few questions for you guys or something to think about because this was supposed to be transitional housing. Now it's being turned into permanent housing. And so are you going to be charging them rent and uh, collecting taxes? Or, I mean, how's that going to work? Is that going to be free for permanent housing as well? Anybody know? Chris? Yes, I do, but <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Um, You're the chair. Are you, are you, is that all you, is that all you had, Linda? I got two minutes, yep. so I, yep, you do. I do. So I just like to have an answer to the question. I believe it. This is always going to be no, that was going like to address that. <laughs> that was going to be. You're wasting question. my time. <laughs> well, no, we'll finish, your finish your time. No, I want to hear what you got to say. So if I have to. Well, we do have the DHHS director here that can help explain the program because your interpretation of it's not accurate in this okay. case. For That's home why I'm trying to clarify. So, um, I don't want to waste your your time, and and then we could respond to that afterwards if if that's okay. With that's you. all right. I, those were my concerns. I, I you know, we got, we're in the middle of a big, we're not even in the middle, we're at the beginning of a recession here, folks. So <laughs> we got to start buttoning up those church strings around here. Thank you. Then 18 is still for clarification. It's not a new contract. It's just pushing the date out because of, uh, or giving us just a little more time to spend the grant funds. Um, so, is there any more public comment uh, online? Yes, I do have another online. Go ahead. David, you are on. 
I, I was just wondering if you could repeat the item numbers that have been pulled from the agenda, the consent agenda. Vice Chair, would you like me to do that? Yes, please. Items number five, items number 14, and item number 19 have been pulled. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else online? Charlie? Vice Chair, none at this time. Any other public comment in the room? Okay, if we would pull the vote for all consent items, uh, save 5, 14, and 19. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if we can, on 18, there was a question on this from the audience and uh, a lack of somewhat proper understanding of that program and, and what this is for. And while we have the director of DHHS here, I think it'd be appropriate if we just uh, kind of just briefly address this if, if she was so willing. Are you so willing, Renee? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Rennell Brown, Director of Department of Health and Human Services. Um, to answer the question, uh, the Home Key Project was originally started uh, for a transitional housing to convert to permanent housing. So this item is to extend the time frame in order to utilize the funds to do the construction. So that was always the purpose of the project. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, now we will move to our, we're on a little bit late, 1025 timed item, our uh, general public comment period. Um, members of the public may address the board on matters which are within the jurisdiction of the board. Um, if you're addressing the board regarding a matter listed on the agenda, you may be asked to hold your comments until the board takes up that matter. Please limit your comments to three minutes or less. Do we have any general public comment? I'm just coming back up here because that lady didn't answer the question at all. So just to be back, placed on record, thank you. Any other public comment? Anyone online? Thank you very much. We'll move on to our 1030 timed item. Approve the request for modified road improvement standards for APN 116-136-002 as follows. The applicant shall not be responsible for constructing road improvements along the frontage of the parcel with the exception of a driveway approach and repair of any road improvements damaged by construction activities as requested by the assistant county engineer that just ran out of the room. Yes, um, <laughs> well, I'm the new my... assistant county engineer, <laughs> uh, now Heidi Constable, community development director. And I'm here to represent this item this morning for all of you. Um, as you noted, Mr. Jackson has requested a modification for road improvements. He applied for a conditional use permit to construct a single family residence in a planned community zone district. He has a rather large property for this area. Uh, because of that, the road improvements would be uh, roughly 490 feet of frontage. Um, there are environmental constraints related to this property which um, really hinder future development of it. Uh, so when Mr. Jackson put together the package to request the modification, uh, he was able to easily express um, the reasons to justify the modification. Uh, our planning commission also concurred that they felt that uh, they were in support of the modification as is staff. Very good. Thank you, Heidi. You're welcome. Do we have any questions for Heidi? I just have one thing I want to say um, to Heidi, and that is um, the parkway issue yeah. was raised in, in meetings that we had previously, and so I'm really pleased that's on our agenda today. Oh, great. So Thank you. so much. You're welcome. Um, my only question is that this, this uh, what you're asking the board to do today is exactly what the Planning Commission has approved suggested that we do as well exactly he would um, only be required to do his driveway improvements and then if there was any damage done to the county road or you know as part of the project that he would need to bring that back to you know the existing condition okay great thank you you're welcome I, I, just, I just was curious there on the drawing that's in our packet today the, we have the Jackson parcel and then the blue line representing the curb gutter and um, with no sidewalk were we asking 
initially, were we asking the Jacksons to extend that beyond their parcel? No, no, we would have only required them to do their front, oh, their frontage. Okay. No, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure exactly that why the, that's colored yeah. that direction. The, the lines no. were, were outside no. of the, or, or beyond the parcel lines. No. There. It kind of confused me as to yeah, what we usually is, ask. Yeah, that is confusing. I mean, I know in some of the areas where we have road improvements in rural areas, uh, where you may have a frontage where we have the improvement start at the beginning of the block, so the improvements develop. Mm -hmm. That hasn't happened for a long time, but um, that's not the case with this. So, no, it was just his frontage Very good. Uh, from what I recall. Supervisor just a, Yeah, just a quick question, because I, I don't want to end up in the same situation that we're, we're at yeah. um, on State Street because some things weren't developed. So, and that... Um, so for the drainage and the sidewalk that's not going to be required to be done there because of all of the environmental issues and just the positioning the, of it? The drainage will still need to be addressed as, as part of the building permit application, but um, the requirement to put in the sidewalk will not be. I just want to be sure we don't end up with the same yeah, situation. No, I, I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Is there any public comment on this item? Very good. And bring it back to the board. I'll entertain a motion. I'll motion that we approve the request for a modified road improvement standards for APN 116-136-002 as follows. Would you like me to read the entire thing? I, I did that already. So you I, did. I All good. right. Well, then I will so move it. Very second. Good. And we have a second. Heidi, would you pull the vote? Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Thank you. Um, we will back up to um, our first consent agenda, agenda item pulled. Supervisor Masson, you asked to pull item number five? Yes, and um, this, this doesn't have anything to do with the quality of services provided or the entity. This has more to do with that it's costing us for the year $1,348,000 and uh, $347 um, and so it has more to do with us looking continuing to look at the pros and cons and whether or not it's more cost effective for us to provide those medical services to the jail um, ourselves and so I just want to be assured that we're continuing to look at that um, as we move forward and that that was my only very good so you don't have any issues with the item then no Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second. Do we have any public comment on item number five on the consent agenda? Anybody online, Tyler? Would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Let's move on to item number 14 that was pulled by Supervisor Howard. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to pull this item because there was some concern expressed by the public. I think most of us saw those concerns expressed, but I wanted an opportunity to dive into this one in more detail. It's uh, my understanding that the county is essentially acting as a pass-through, but I want folks to understand why we're acting as a pass-through, in particular with mental health services to the school district. Um, I think this plays, and it's really well-timed, given um, the basically mental illness, behavioral health issues that we're seeing within school districts across the country. And as far as being proactive about it, and especially the school district taking this on head on with these funds, I think it's important that we help communicate how we're being proactive to the rest of the community. Brunel, thanks for coming up and helping to address this issue. Yes, absolutely. So you are correct. This is really more of a pass through funds. Uh, the Del Norte County Office of Education took the lead completed the application, really did all of the necessary um, elements to complete the application, that as the county entity, we will be the ones applying for the funding and then set up an agreement in order to pass those funds back to them. Um, just to highlight some of the services, there'll be coordinated services with our local community providers, including um, DHHS. Uh, they're looking to hire four staff in order to man that program. Some of this will include um, stationary sites, such as at the high school, the continuation high school, middle school, as well as a mobile team 
that will go around to the different schools in order to provide those services. Um, and basically, it's really to engage with families and help destigmatize youth mental health. Thank you, Anil. I appreciate your time. And, and I just want to add that I think that this is exactly what needs to happen. So right now, we're we're trying to fix adults who are suffering from major mental health that weren't addressed early on. And this is ex precisely how we should be going about this. This is going, like I've said a couple times, is going far enough upstream to try and catch these people so that they don't have to suffer their whole lives with mental illnesses. They can get those tools that they need to address it early on. And so I'm very supportive of this and, and I'm hoping that, that we are successful. And then, uh, Rennell, additionally, one of the, the concerns expressed was the invasion of privacy potentially and or, you know, engaging with a child with maybe without parental consent is, can you speak to that at this time or do you know enough about how that program works? Yeah, I have, I'm not uh, privy to those exact details. Um, the, the school district really took the lead on that and are developing those specifics and so I don't think that they've determined exactly what that process is but definitely privacy is always important when dealing with mental health issues. Yep. And as Supervisor Starkey suggested this is definitely one of those things where we need to move upstream quickly on. Um, we don't need an incident like we saw in Texas here in our own schools. So yeah. appreciate that. And with that I'd make the motion to approve. Uh, Thank you very much Supervisor Master. Yeah, I'll second, but I wanted some go, discussion. Go right ahead. <laughs> so um, one of um, my issues, I'm really excited about this, number one, because I think it's a great opportunity to, for us to address um, the issues within our school, especially with the increased anxiety that's occurred with our experience through the COVID episode. So I'm excited about that. One of the things I am concerned about, though, is the lower grades, and I I'm assuming that the mobile unit is going to be for the lower grades throughout the county and then with the existing employees I'm assuming that they're going to have so many hours and days at the two high schools and the middle school and then extra time would be going with the mobile unit throughout the the elementary grades is that that's where my concern is to ensure that's what's going to happen mm -hmm. um, but also for the 5th District, Margaret Keating uh, and so does Smith River always get left out of those kind of services and there's a, a huge need and I just want to be assured that that mobile unit will be visiting those sites on a regular basis as they do um, within the, the other areas of the county. So. Sure. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so I will, you know, I don't know their exact schedule, what they have in mind for that. They'll be coordinating that, but they will have a director and three technicians that they're hiring with the funding. Um, and it is my understanding that the intent of the mobile unit is to visit all of the other sites that don't have a permanent um, site, the three I mentioned. Okay, so if you could just um, make sure that gets reiterated. Sure. And the other thing is for them to consider, um, and I know at the middle school there's been some escalation of some um, activities. Um, so I want to ensure that they do some anger management within their um, process of dealing with, um, you know, the schools and mental health issues, that that's a serious issue and that in the lower grades we need to be able to um, teach um, healthy tools um, for um, students to be able to utilize that can deal with anger management and those issues um, because I'm, I'm concerned about the escalating of activities for aggression and guns and others at the middle school and so I think if, if that can be incorporated somehow into um, what they're doing with the school. Yeah. And that's understandable. I'm happy to communicate that information to them. Thank you. Any public comment on this item online? Yes, I have one online. Go ahead. Brandon, you are on. Good morning again. Thank you. Yes, very sad that we're seeing this in our time. It's frustrating for everyone. Our kids are supposed to have all these opportunities to be able to enjoy childhood and life. And as parents, we, we can't deliver that right now. So where, where does it start? I don't know. Maybe the lack of respect, I think, has a lot to do with things. Um, people not being willing to hear other people's perspectives and people 
enforcing their views on other people. You know, we how do, does the school district get away with not allowing parents on campus, but yet we can put more shrinks on campus? I mean, where are our priorities? Where are our faith-based establishments in helping? Where's the brotherhood in our community? I mean, I know I, if, if we could solve the problems with two and a half million dollars, I'd give it to them. Let's give them more than that. But it's not going to stop with the money. It, it's not going to stop by economizing the problem. We need to, I mean, we're, we're creating these stigmas by talking about it so much. We're creating these stereotypes by labeling each other. I don't believe that government should be in the business of providing health care. Know your role as government leaders. Please. Do not start labeling our kids. Where does it stop? Can they medicate them? Can they label them? It's a slippery slope. And I just ask you to use some government restraint. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. I, I'm glad to hear that there's a program being developed, and this is why. I recently discovered that my firearm was missing. And I knew where it went. Because my grandson had taken it. I've since then retrieved it. But it hit home. I don't know how close we are here in Del Norte County. What happened in Uvalde could happen here. I do know that the cops are. Uh, I've talked to Chief. I haven't had a chance to talk to. I'm yeah, sorry. Mr. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> <Sheriff> Scott. <laughs> um, and I don't worry about them going in if something happens in our high school or any school and taking care of the matter. But recognizing that kids have an issue with anger, are isolated, are in a controlling environment, um, you don't know what can happen, you don't know when, and it's right in our backyard too. So I appreciate that this program is being developed. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Shelly, do we have any other? I don't have any online, Mr. None online. So um, we do have a motion and a second. Would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. And with that, we will move to our 1040 timed item, the local performing arts center presentation from Nick and Lisa Rail. Welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate you being here. Two miracles happened for me in 1959. Going to Redwood, Redwood Union Elementary as it was called back then, the school decided to offer school band for the very first time. It was a demonstration of all the instruments. I chose the trumpet and I was so excited to go home and tell my parents. On the school bus home, that day I realized my father making a dollar and a quarter an hour at the plywood mill, this would, the buying of the trumpet would be, it would take three, four weeks work at least. So they would endorse the idea, but they wouldn't be able to afford it. I made the pitch anyhow, and to my great surprise, they said, we're gonna figure out how to do this. So I was lucky twice um, that day. I went from a blank white canvas to one covered with all colors 
Overnight, I had friends from fourth through eighth grade, some of them still best friends today. Went through a wonderful time at Delnord High School with Gene Petrick, went to UC Berkeley, UC Santa Barbara, emphasis on music, and then went on to music retail and 50 years in Southern California with six stores concentrating on service to schools, parents, kids, and in 2019, I sold the business and my wife and I decided to take that check, turn it over and endorse the entire proceeds to support the performing arts and public education in Del Norte County. We moved back here in January of 2020 and we haven't looked back. We are so happy to be here. Growing up in the 50s and 60s, the rural community that we grew up in was vibrant now as the fourth most impoverished county in the state. Lots of work to be done. I look at the kids. I look at how lucky I was. I look at the opportunity my wife and I have to give that same opportunity that I received that day in 1959 to our youth. Um, with the nonprofit that we formed to date, we have given enough new band instruments to the school district that no child who wants to participate in band would be not denied the opportunity due to the lack of an instrument. I feel really great about that because I snuck in the door just with a whisper and a prayer. We have installed a band instrument repair shop at the high school. The band director, Dan Sedgwick, has expertise in repair. He's teaching a class in that. It's successful enough that this next year it goes to two classes and we've already had students graduate, go off to vocational technical school, and are employed in the field of band instrument repair, which is a great industry. Lisa and I spearheaded the renovation of Crescent Elk Auditorium. I remember performing on the, in there in the 60s, thinking we can do better than this, and we come back 50 years later, by gosh, we have to do better than this. Our big one single item, my wife and I, on our bucket list is to build a performing arts center at the high school campus. And we formed the Partnership for the Performing Arts nonprofit. The Performing Arts Center will have a thousand seats, 700 on the main floor, 300 in the balcony, and it will be on the school campus between the band room and Washington Boulevard. $42 million cost and doors to open in January of 2028. Our mission statement is students first, community second, and visiting performers third. And there are such a multitude of uses for the center. Students will have a facility that will transform their educational experience and give them equal access to resources most others take for granted. An incredibly diverse local and regional community will have a venue in which to showcase its talents and celebrate its cultural richness. Area residents will experience an ongoing range of professional performing artists they currently must travel hundreds of miles to see. Local and regional businesses will benefit from the increased economic activity that comes with attendance at performances, community gatherings, conferences, and special events. A community regularly exposed to the threats of tsunamis will have a much needed emergency evacuation center inside the city limits, outside the tsunami zone, and located on the high school campus, which includes a cafeteria. A community that has struggled for decades in the face of economic decline and loss of identity will rise with new pride as the hub for the arts, creativity, education, safety, and excellence. Um, we have a wonderful par partnership with the Illinois Unified School District. They are providing the land for this. We have a memorandum of understanding drawn up by an uh, attorney who specializes in such arrangements. The partnership for the performing arts raises the money. The district is in charge of design, bid, bill, build for the facility. They will own it and then the partnership will manage it. Steve Morgan, the director of facilities and construction at the high school prior to coming here oversaw a quarter billion dollar overhaul of Monterey Peninsula Community College and he will be overseeing this project and we couldn't have a better person in place 
for this. We will be working with CBK Architects, the nation's largest architect for educational institutional building in the United States. And as a subcontractor to them, we've brought in Jones and Jones Architects out of Seattle. They've done a lot of work and continue to work, do work for the Talawa Daini Nation, and they will be in charge of providing a Pacific Northwest Coast aesthetic to inside and outside the facility. The experience will start when you get out of your car. This center will be a gift to and an investment in the community, not a drain on local resources. The majority of the funds that we raise will be outside the city, outside the county, outside the, even outside the state. Um, our organization, the board, I'll read off our members, Abby Christ, Candace Tinkler, Christy Lynn Rust, Diana Clark, Jim McQuillan, John Pritchett, Ku Vu, Loretta Stoner, Luis Palayo, Marshall Jones, Rick Hawley, Sarah Val Valley, and myself. On contract to us, Angela Glora, former executive director of First Five, a federal and state grant writing, Kathy Kaplaner, has a public relations firm in Los Angeles, Because PR. Lise Hamilton is our local attorney. Paul Mortimer is based in Portland and is the person that we're using for our facility, uh, our feasibility study. Russ Levin, based out of LA, but having spent 25 years in Southern Oregon working with JPR, the Brit Festival, among many other things during a 30 year career in private donor fundraising is our capital campaign director. Potential funding sources, my wife and I, Lisa, have publicly pledged a million dollars to this project. Del Norte Unified is 110% behind the project and as I previously stated, they have provided the land. We will be approaching state and federal, including California Development Block Grants, USDA, working with the tribes, private foundations, private donors, and the alumni project that we have is fantastic. There are 15,000 alumni of Del Norte High School walking around the planet, and there's no database for them. And we have a project spearheaded by Christy Lynn Rust to identify the 12,000 alumni who do not live in the county starting with 1950. And that's a magic puzzle. Every time we find somebody that, wow, I like that, and yes, I would love to help. It's another piece of the magic puzzle. Uh, we've also been doing extensive work in Brookings. Brookings would also love to have a performing arts center. They have not been able to do it. They've been trying for 10 years, and they have um, reacted positively to our invitation to join us and we erased the county line. It's already well erased, but we're gonna erase it even more and join two rural communities in great need of a facility such as this. The facility itself, I just wanna give you an image of it. Concerts in the gym, the kids play all year and then this is what they get, a concert in the gym. Christy Lynn's gonna talk a little bit more about that during public comments, but Having a concert in the gym after you practice and rehearse all year, what if we had a championship league football game and we played it in a parking lot? That's what it's like. That is what it's like. So how to help. Tell the story, endorse the project, provide a testimonial. We're not here today with our hands out. We're here today to be blessed by the County Board of Supervisors. Our goal is a to have a conclusive list of every agency, office, and organization in Del Norte and Southern Curry counties that supports our vision. We cannot be successful if the community at large doesn't share our passion. I am asking for your help in harnessing the positive energy at our fingertips to make this transformative gift a reality for our youth, our community, and our future. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mr. Rillo. Supervisor Matson. Yes, thank you so much, and thank you for your um, support and your vision. Um, I am <coughs> extremely excited about this. I have seen the difference that it makes in students' lives. Um, I attended a, a spring concert at Margaret Keating uh, recently, and just the joy and the 
excitement around being able to play an instrument and to sing and to um, was in the confidence of those young people and the happiness that it brought them, smiles on their faces and, um, and the pride that their parents had in watching them. Um, I was able to see firsthand the difference that the performing arts makes in our community. So I'm extremely excited about this. I hope you will join our team as we look at how we enhance tourism in uh, Del Mar County, because it fits very well into that. And although you're not asking for many, I want to pledge 500 to you um, for this effort, because I totally believe in, in what you stand for and what you're doing, and um, you have uh, my support uh, wholeheartedly for this effort. I am, I am, and I'm speaking for the board, and mostly speaking for the community, especially the youth, I'm honored. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Supervisor Masky. I'm not going to give you $500, but I, I do think <laughs> what you're doing is really amazing, and I've got a really big mouth, and, and I think what you've asked us to do is to tell the story and promote the project, and I'm, I'm fully capable of doing that, and I will uh, help in any way I can. Once again, the for the board and for our youth and for the community, I'm so honored. Supervisor Hyman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, oftentimes, we're accused as a board of not uh, being part of a bigger vision for this community. And you have certainly offered with your board a vision for this community, a vision that really encompasses our youth and sets the importance of our youth on a path a path of achievement and belonging. Something that you felt when you were young and more importantly, something that you feel important as an adult to pass on. And um, your presentation today is 100% addictive. It's 100% addictive because it, it garners support from a broad base of the community. Why wouldn't we support a project like this? There's, I could think of no reason not to support a vision that goes straight to our youth and supports them feeling like they belong here, something we so desperately need here in Delnar County. And my hope, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that at some point, as requested by both Nick and Lisa, that the board would honor the request today and we could honor that through a proclamation that would help support this vision. So if the day comes where assistance or staff time is needed to help bring that to fruition, the board's support through that proclamation would be in cement and help give staff time and direction to help to support this future vision for our community. Thank you, thank you very much. Great idea, great idea. And Mr. Rill, I just wanted to relate to you. My, my wife Annette and I, we have six kids. We've raised them in this county. Currently, our youngest is Lydia. She's a sixth grader at Crescent Elk. Um, when I was growing up here in the county, uh, my friends in band had their band instruments. And you know how it looks like. There's the, you have the, the bailing wire on the handle and the duct tape and the spray paint. And <laughs> chewing gum. And, and chewing gum. <laughs> yes, all of that. Um, well, my daughter Lydia says, Dad, I think I want, I'd love to play trumpet. So I'm, I'm going to join band. She did this halfway through the year all on her own. I've, there's, there's no musical talent from here that's, that's going to Lydia. But a few days later, she brings home a trumpet in a brand new case and opens this up. It's just shiny and glowing, no dents. It's not bent. It is a brand new musical instrument. And she, I mean, just the, the look on her face and, the, and the, the ambition that she picked up this instrument with uh, was really remarkable because it's a whole different thing when you pick up a bent and dented piece of equipment. I think the whole mindset is different. And this is how we change lives. Yes, yes. Um, she she played that thing like crazy in the house. We actually bought her a mute <laughs> to put in the end of it. Um, but she kept right on playing. And uh, then she said, Dad, I think I wanted to try a saxophone. And sure enough, a couple days later, she comes home with another brand new saxophone in the case just absolutely beautiful instruments they play very nicely um, I, I just from my family it's um, can't thank you enough for the the donation you made to the to all the children of the county that they're getting interested in music so I just wanted to express my appreciation thank you 
with the, with the partnership for the performing arts and especially for the nonprofit and for me personally, it's really easy when you only have one thing on your bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> Not too hard to focus. That's true. So that is true. Thank you. Well, I thank you very much for being here today, Mr. Rio. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Public comment. Is there any public comment on this presentation? So my name is Stephen Jackson. Uh, Mr. Short, I actually share a similar story to you for having a large family and kids that are going through the music program and whatnot. And I actually have a picture of my daughter here with one of those brand new instruments that you were able to bring into the program. So you know, when I was going through school here, it was back in the, the 90s, and the only thing I was able to, to get my attention for music was a recorder. You know, that was the only instrument the school could provide to me, and <laughs> it wasn't enough to hook me. And, and while I, I love music, I love listening to it, I was never much of a performer. So um, it's really exciting for me to see my kids uh, really get involved. And uh, I know you get a, your family gets a lot of attention for the instruments that you provided. But it goes beyond that. Um, my oldest is uh, 15, just went through a freshman year at the high school and was excited because the choral program actually has a full-time teacher now. But that's because of the commitment that the school district has made, because of the commitment your family has made into it too. So um, she set goals, reached madrigals, you know, inside of her freshman year and uh, um, was so proud of herself for it. So um, the one part that does pain me from your presentation is you had to say um, that this won't be a drain on the community. And that, it just hurts because when we think about what this does for an opportunity, earlier we had a presentation about mental health services and, and with our youth, and we're swatting at symptoms for our youth for after they're actually diagnosed or after they, they display symptoms of the illness. And this gives us a chance to be able to shape those minds. You know, 12, 14 years ago, there was an initiative brought in to be able to give healthy foods to nourish our children and to have healthy bodies and healthy minds that way. And this is an opportunity for healthy minds and, and, uh, and development of a cognitive level starting from a really young age that can combat a lot of the stuff that we're seeing in the adults that fall through the cracks. So I, I implore you guys, you know, I, I love the idea of um, um, having a, a memorandum in place for supporting this project as it goes to the future because this is never going to be a drain. This is an investment in our youth, an investment in our future. Yes, it could have a financial gain for the community, but beyond that, it could save a lot of our children and actually give them an opportunity for family. It gives them an opportunity for goal setting, for uh, um, for just healing in a natural way through music. You know, it's a, it's a timeless thing that, that's happened, you know, through history. So uh, thank you, you know, for what your family has done for my family. Um, it's, it's huge in what you guys are doing for the community. any online good morning I'm uh, John Pritchett uh, I was very honored to be asked to be on the board and real quickly um, we, we used the word vision several times and we all have a vision of a performing arts center what makes Nick's visions different Nick's visions different is he has a vision of the roadmap of how we're going to get there and that vision is in 3d with neon lights and uh, that makes it much different than any of the previous efforts we've seen before so I, uh, I think I'm preaching to the choir a little bit here but I urge you to support this effort thank you good morning to all of you it's a, it's an honor to chat with you and uh, to be here. My name is Christy Lynn Rust, and I am the retired music teacher at Del Norte High School. I moved to Del Norte in 1978 to teach here, from, and I came from uh, the big city of Los Angeles. And uh, what I found was that um, holding band concerts inside the gymnasium was like listening to a bumblebee in a tin can. Um, the band students unaffectionately call it the toilet tank. <laughs> it's like, do we have to go to the toilet tank again? Yeah, yeah, it's the only place. So we used to hold a lot of our concerts outside, and we try to get creative and that sort of thing. Anyway, my kids, um, they would work their tails off all year long to put on this big concert, and, uh, and uh, this is how we 
celebrate their achievements is to put them in the gymnasium. So that's a tough one. Uh, it's now been over 60 years since Donut High School, the new one, uh, if you want to call it new, opened. And nothing, I mean, I repeat, nothing has changed for the kids. Uh, last spring, I attended a music department concert in the same gymnasium that I did. And yet again, the room destroyed all of the work that they did. It was just clanging and clattering throughout the whole, and I'm just, my heart was falling out. Um, we, we really need to do better. We need a performing arts center. Um, I'm sure you probably know this, but we're actually in the last perform um, auditorium for Del Norte High School. This is actually the auditorium that was never replaced at the new high school. The windows are the same as Crescent Elk School. There is a slant in the floor that continues that direction, and obviously they pulled the seats out and whatnot. But um, uh, perhaps there are still a few notes ringing in this room. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you for listening to me, and thanks for your support. Thank you very much. Yeah. I've had two hands go up okay. online. Go ahead. Caller with 465-2623, you are on. You just need to unmute your mic. Good morning. Uh, my name is Angela Stanley. I'm a parent of three children at in Del Norte County Schools. Um, my oldest is graduating on Friday um, and was very heavily involved in the music department. Band, jazz band, madrigals, instrument repair. Um, last semester he had one class that wasn't in the music department. Um, and my youngest is a seventh grader at Smith River who plays the trombone. Uh, my oldest was given a saxophone for his birthday a few years ago. You know, decent saxophone, I thought. Um, my, he came home from school this year with a brand new Nick Rail Foundation saxophone that we were allowed to look at and not touch. Uh, he has had so much joy and pleasure playing that saxophone. He, his playing has improved. He was good before. He's really improved with the quality of a brand new instrument. I know that my kids won't get the joy of being a student performing in this center. Maybe Ian, maybe the kid. Um, but I really hope that the Board of Supervisors and Del Norte County and the city and everyone does everything they can to support the Nick Rail Foundation and their goal of giving Del Norte County the Performing Arts Center that, uh, that the county deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dan, you are on. You just need to unmute your mic. Dan, are you there? Dan decided not to join us after all. Um, hello? Here we go. Hello, Dan. Oh, oh this is actually one of his students. Um, I just, I'm calling on behalf of the band to say that I'm extremely uh, thankful for all of the music instruments that Nick Rail has donated to our school and the whole entire uh, district as a whole. And I want to say, um, thank you for the, yeah, I'm unmuted right now. Okay. <laughs> and I want to say thank you for the Hello. opportunity to have um, the, the Performing Arts Center. So, uh, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you for your time. <laughs> That's great. Vice Chair, that is all online. That is all. Any other public comment from the room? All right. Well, thank you very much. Again, Mr. and Mrs. Rail, always a pleasure. Very much appreciate your efforts and all the great things you're doing for our community. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, I, I would like um, the board to recognize at one of our future meetings and uh, work with staff 
if we can come to some consensus for that, work with staff to figure out the best um, venue for a proclamation or resolution that would help align us with other community partners because as they pursue the federal and state dollars, they need to know that this community is 100% on board with the Performing Arts Center. So if we could look to do that at a future meeting, I'd love to have some consensus on that today. I would, I would love to see that too, yes. So, so work on that. Nick and Lisa, it sounds like you'll have all of our very outspoken mouths and support <laughs> at a future date. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Very good, okay, yes. <laughs> okay, if I'm not mistaken, we have one other item on the consent agenda that was pulled, item number 19. And this is just for clarification, um, and if, if Rennell, um could at least clarify this. There was an indication that this Dillner Mission Possible was actually related or somehow the Daily Bread Ministry. Is that something you could confirm for us? Are they the same group, a nonprofit? Um, because when it was mentioned to us, I didn't know the two groups were related. So they are separate entities, are um, corporations, I think, or LLCs. What did they do? Yeah, nonprofit um, organizations. So um, operating, you know, in the same location at one time, but now um, have set up a different nonprofit in order to move on with the mission for the emergency shelter project. Mm -hmm. So separate. And so, who is the current director of this organization, Delmar Mission? Daphne Post, Cortez you? Lambert is the director. Um, and she has been really working hard on a lot of areas in the community to address homelessness. So it's really exciting to see the collaboration um, because we all know it's a community issue, not just one organization or one entity. So she's really taken the lead on many areas around homelessness. Thank you for your time, Renelle. Sure. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Thank you for that motion. Is there a second? Second. Do we have any public comment on item number 19? I just wanted to let you know that um, there's people showing up over at the Harrington house at night and they're homeless. It's pretty clear they're homeless. It's not for domestic abuse, but um, they were under the impression at the Harrington house that we had no homeless shelter. So do we have two homeless shelters or do we have one with 17 beds? I nope, think, anybody? I think, I think currently we don't have a homeless shelter. We yeah. don't? Then what's this number 19 all about? To build it's it. the shelter that Delnart Mission Possible is putting together. Oh, so, th so there is no homeless shelter. In Correct. All right, thank you. Any other public comment on item number 19? None online? Okay, bring back to the board and pull the vote. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Okay, I believe we covered the consent agenda. So we'll move on to regular items. Um, item number 25, approve and authorize the chair to sign and send a letter of support for Saracos Hospital's request for exception to apply for a hospice license in Delaware County pursuant to SB 664 as requested by Supervisor Starkey. Thank you. I was approached by um, Sutter Hospital to see if we couldn't uh, um, nudge some of our legislatures to, to uh, <laughs> allow them to have an exception for the hospice program. So I, I sent my own letter um, on behalf of myself, um, but I thought it would be good coming from the board as well. Um, I, I want to do update. I, I got an email um, last week from the Chief of Staff for uh, Assemblymember Wood's office saying that they um, have already reached out to the department on this and that the limitation for hospice programs was really due to the abuse coming in for non-for-profit hospice groups and not individual facilities. So they are working on legislation to, to clarify that more, but they feel um, they have already made calls with the department and already have had the Center Coast Hospitals 
um, request expedited because it was never intended for that. So we're, we're uh, just kind of a follow-up letter of support, but it sounds like this is already in the works and something that will already be approved. Very good. Thank yeah, you. and I just follow up on that. I, I'm really appreciative of Supervisor Starkey passion around this. It's long overdue for Delmar County. And I know we have others that have a similar vision to bring this care and service to our community. And it's unfortunate that um, the legislation that impacted and at least put um, a barrier in for these type of services to be utilized here in Delnar County has been a roadblock to a certain extent for years now from bringing these services here. I'm glad that there's an exemption process that we could utilize in a path forward for this desperately needed program. So with that, I'd uh, make that motion. Thank you. We have I'll a motion. Second it. motion and a second. Do we have any public comment on this item? I have a hand raised online. Very good. Go ahead. Tamara, you are on. You just need to unmute your mic. Um, hello, this is Tamara Layton, and um, my husband passed away about three and a half years ago uh, without hospice services. I have talked to Senator McGuire about this, Assemblyman Jim Wood. I've talked to Mitch Hanna, and I am just so pleased to see any action on this topic for our community. Um, so I appreciate all of your support, and if there's anything that I can do um, as an individual to help move this forward, please reach out. I know that there are other people in the community who I've talked to who would also like to help make this happen. So I'm, I'm appreciative, but I'm also willing to help with the work. So thank you so much. Very good. Thank you, Tamara, for your comment. Any other comments? I do not have any more online. Very good. Um, Anything else from the board? Okay, we'll vote. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Okay, moving on to item number 26. Approve and adopt an ordinance amending section 14.12.060 related to general standard prohibition requirements for holding tanks and adding chapter 16 related to vault privies to title 14 of the Delaware County Code and two, designate county council to prepare a summary of the ordinance for publication as requested by the director of the community development department. And this is the, uh, this is the ordinance that we uh, introduced last meeting, is that, that's correct? Yes, it is, and I'm available to respond to any questions you may have questions? today. I have no questions, but I'll motion to approve. Got a motion? I'll second. And a second. Do we have any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any. No public comment. Go ahead and pull the vote, please. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Okay, item number 27. Approve and authorize the step increase to A1 Step F effective May 26, 2022 for County Council as requested by the Board of Supervisors. A motion to approve. We've got a motion. Second. And a second. Is there any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any online, Chair. Okay, uh, if you would pull the vote, please. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Um, item number 28 on budget transfers. Approve and adopt budget transfer 05. Vice Chair? Yes. Sorry to interrupt, um, but can we take up item number 36 before we take up budget transfers because 36 needs to be approved before item number 30? We can certainly do that. Thank you. Item number 36, approve the request to purchase a new commercial dishwasher for the juvenile hall as requested by the chief probation officer and as reviewed and recommended by the county administrative officer and auditor controller. Motion. Move to approve. We have a motion and a second. I'll second. Thank you very much. I do have a question if, if you wouldn't mind. And Supervisor Starkey. Um, because the two are related, um, the budget transfer item says up to 20000 yet the um, quote on this is for 10180 um, Does anything need to be modified because of that? I just don't, I mean, just the, if the quote is so much less than the up to, I thought we could modify it. Huh? Neil, would you speak to that? Yes. 
Uh, no, there isn't any modification uh, needed. That's why it says up to 20,000. Uh, that was the original request from the department. We are having a difficult time finding units that meet the specs and the dimensions of the current unit. It's the one that was originally installed uh, when Juvenile was built over 20 years ago. And so that's the only quote we've been able to get so far. But the original quotes were quite a bit higher than that, okay. but they were units that didn't meet the specs. Okay. I just wanted to, to make sure I did, wanted to double check. Thank mm -hmm. you. I believe I already asked for public comment. Go ahead. No? Is there any public comment on this item? Thank you, Kylie, for keeping me straight. Is there uh, any I have none online. None online. No. Would you pull the vote then, please? Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for keeping us going in the right direction here. Okay, budget transfer. Approve and adopt budget transfer 05-08, the amount of $8,497 within the agricultural budget. Approve uh, budget transfer 05-11 in the amount of $19,500 within the boating safety budget. And then the 06-03 um, in the amount of $20,000 within the miscellaneous revenue and expenditure asset vehicles budget unit and the juvenile hall budget unit. Move to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have any public comment on these budget transfer items? Vice Chair, I'm not seeing any online. None online. Would you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. I'd like to be cognizant of everybody's needs. We've been going for about an hour and a half. Does anybody need to take a break? No? Keep right on going through. Legislative and budget issues, item number 31. Review, discuss, and take possible action on the proposed budget for fiscal year 22-23 for the Donor Solid Waste Management Authority as requested by the Director of the Solid Waste Management Authority. Any comments for this item? No, but since I attended this meeting and already went through um, the budget, I would make the motion. Very good. We have a Vice Chair, I believe in the report it states if there's no action taken, then the report is approved. Okay. I could be wrong on that, so oh, I don't think we do need a I, motion. I okay. believe I believe you're correct. So if there is no action, we're good. And we don't have any action from the board. So we will move on to item number thirty two. Consider, review, and approve the proposed Fiscal year 22-23 Border Coast Regional Airport Authority budget as requested by Border Coast Regional Airport Authority Director. Move to approve, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion to approve. Do I'll we have second. A second? And we have a second. Is there any public comment on this item? Not online. Thank you very much. Could you pull the vote, please? Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Moving right along. Item number 33, approve and authorize the chair to sign a comment letter expressing local concerns with SB 1338, the legislation containing the proposed Community Assistance Recovery and Empowerment uh, Care Corp program, and direct staff to transmit the letter to the author of the bill, as well as the county's representative and the legislative advocate, as requested by Supervisor Howard. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this has been something I've been uh, discussing on the dais now with the board and the public uh, for quite some period of time ever since we, we caught word that this legislation would be uh, coming forward. It's been very onerous legislation in the sense that there's some penalty and strings attached if counties essentially do not have the ability to implement some of these things penalties in terms of fines that could be levied by the courts if we were to not take action. Nobody's saying that this county would not want to take action in helping to really support the vision, in this case, of our state legislature and um, the governor's office, who is also a, a sponsor and co-signer of this. However, the way it's being approached has been, um, I th think, a little overreaching especially for rural California, and in particular for Delaware County. Um, the letter before you today took a lot of time 
and iterations with the county council's office, Randy Hooper taking the lead for the county and also DHHS. And so it is very well thought out. It is very much to the point of how it specifically impacts Del Norte County, which I think is going to be important for members of the state legislature, both on the assembly and Senate to consider. Um, I, I just wanted to say, and I know it's listed here in great detail, what our response to the authors are. However, um, I know Randy's here with us today, Rennell's here with us today, Joel's here with us today that could answer any concerns or questions from this letter. But I do want to say um, this is us being proactive in helping to craft legislation that does impact Delnor County. And when we see what is just often termed unfunded mandates from the state, this is one of those times where this would be an unfunded mandate which could have a, a traumatic impact on our future. So hopefully we could have some similar consensus with other counties in the state and a f impact and change this legislation. Very good, thank you Supervisor Howard. Yeah, and I, I do wanna add that um, what Supervisor Howard is, is stating is very important for us to, to realize that this is one of those one size fits all that they're trying to um, impose on rural counties, but with this letter, what was, and I don't know who, who drafted it. Um, it says Jerry Hemmingson, but um, not 100% sure yeah. because there's, it's really, really good. Um, but <laughs> there's no, no dish to him. But, but what I really appreciate about this letter is that you got very specific on how it's going to impact us very specifically. And I think that is, needs to be heard in Sacramento. And so, I, I'm very much opposed to the CARES Court as it's structured now. If, if things change, then it's certainly something that, that might work. It might be beneficial to all of California and Donor County. So I just want to put out there that I do appreciate that this letter really targeted our county and how it's going to impact us. So thank you. Supervisor Massa, go ahead. Well, uh, the letter is very wordy, um, <laughs> so I, I am just questioning, do we provide or do, do our um, lobbyists provide um, language that we'd like to see in it that would um, strengthen um, our position for, you know, why we're opposing? Do we provide language that we would like to see them include that would meet our needs? in this particular um, bill because I think this bill is going to move forward so it's important for them to understand how it impacts us but also for them to understand what could improve it so that it doesn't um, have that um, kind of impact on the county. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to be blessed. I'd like to uh, thank Randy Hooper. Ab absolutely. I was just about to ask Mr. Hooper if you'd, if you would, Mr. Hooper, yes. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yeah, this this is a huge um, thing for you know the state to consider. It's it's been um, an issue that you know is uh, affecting every corner of the state. Um, so there's been a great urgency, I think, on the part of everyone from the governor through the legislature through local government to really take this issue seriously. Um, and what uh, we did collectively try to do, and this really was a collective effort uh, between the administration, council, DHHS, um, even the public defenders. Um, was to be as specific as we could be with our, our feedback. Um, we didn't want this to be a, a letter of opposition that was just, you know, no, 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 because we all, we all understand that it is needed and it very has, it very much uh, has legs. Um, it will likely be signed by the governor after it gets through the legislature. So again, trying to be constructive with our approach, um, the way that Joel had initially structured the letter was focused on very specific points. And from there, we kind of built our case uh, based on local uh, considerations that we felt were important for uh, the legislature to be taken into account. Um, specific issues, you know, such as housing. Um, are we really gonna be penalized for not being able to provide housing whenever it isn't really the county that is in the business of creating the housing? We create the conditions that housing can be constructed within. That's our obligation, but is it fair um, for these penalties to exist where we would be held accountable for a lack of, uh, of that opportunity when it is really anything that we you know, have um, control over? So again, we did try to be, to be as constructive as we could be. I think if you look at each of those individual points that we've kind of laid out, uh, we did try to be constructive in the way that we approached it. Um, and you know, certainly in, included uh, language in the letter that you know, let the state know that this was something that we do uh, understand the value of. So 
if there's any specific questions, I'm, I'm certainly available, but that was uh, our intention in approaching the letter. I also think it was well written. As Supervisor Starkey said, uh, laying out the points that, and specific to Delnort County, I, I, I very much appreciate the effort that was put into drafting the letters. Okay. Thank you. Any more comments from the board? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say, you know, after talking to the California State Association of Counties, Graham Kanas, who's the director, um, he responded to me immediately after this draft came out and said this was the most well-written, well-pointed letter he had seen directed to the state legislature. So your efforts, I think, will serve as a model for other rural California counties in helping to craft their thoughts as we approach these two senators on this legislation. So I really appreciate your time and energy and focus on this. Outstanding. Is there any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any online, but I do want to clarify that the letter has been updated and reflects the vice chair's name. Oh, uh, I just want to mention that. But it was scanned. I sure know somebody else wrote this. It was scanned <laughs> prior to the updated letter, so I just wanted to clarify that. Very good. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, you know being that it does have my name on it. Um, I'm very much appreciative of the effort that was put into it, and hearing that it that, that uh, Grant was was impressed uh, really. It's, it's not surprising with our staff, but it's, it's pretty cool to hear. Okay. Um, with that, I guess we'll take I didn't get an, uh, I didn't get a motion or a second. A motion. I'll, I'll motion to oh. approve that we send this letter. I was thinking we had motions yeah. already. I'm sorry. Second. That was the last item. I appreciate that. We have a motion and a second. Thank you, Supervisor Starkey and Howard. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Vice Chair Short. Yes. Thank you again. Um, item number 34, receive an update on active state legislation of interest. Authorize the chair to sign the proposed comment letters and direct staff to transmit the letters to the authors of the bills. And Randy, are you going to take up this item? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So this um, is really a continuation, I think, of the conversation that we started with at the last meeting, uh, which was the board adopting a legislative platform for this uh, legislative cycle. Um, as I think I indicated at the time, um, it would have been really ideal to get the legislative platform put together earlier in the year uh, moving forward, you know, next year. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll start as soon as uh, these bills are all uh, signed into law, probably this fall, um, where we start to really look at, you know, kind of framing our position uh, legislatively for next year. Uh, we've heard with very uh, good consistency or very great consistency um, that engaging early and often with your legislators on these issues really does make a difference. And so um, I think we're making a committed effort on the part of staff to get these issues in front of the board so that we can be engaged in as constructive as a way as, as we can be. Um, so as I, as I noted uh, during the legislative platform uh, conversation, there's literally hundreds thousands of bills, you know, that get introduced, kind of work their way through the, the legislative process every year. It's a pretty um, daunting task to be able to, you know, kind of wade through the complexities of all the different uh, pieces of legislation that have been introduced. We're very fortunate uh, that we have a good uh, partnership uh, with CSAC, as uh, uh, Mr. Howard just uh, noted, as well as RCRC. Um, RCRC does uh, monthly uh, legislative update calls via Zoom uh, with all the counties and the, the leadership at RCRC. Um, and they do a really good job of, you know, kind of ironing out, um, you know, the, the various uh, aspects that need to be considered, focusing on the specific bills that are probably the most uh, pressing to the counties, particularly the rural counties in the case of RCRC, but, but certainly with CSAC as well. Um, and then in addition to uh, those representative uh, groups, those uh, county groups, we also have our advocate groups, uh, which on the state side is, is Sean Yoder, and they're a, a huge uh, benefit in terms of our, our process as well. Uh, they really, for example, emphasized the need to be as specific as we could be on local issues on the care court uh, legislation, which made us you know, reconsider our initial approach and, and I think ultimately you know, end up with a better product there. Um, so in terms of uh, the legislative process and, and the hundreds of bills that we've, we've been looking at, uh, we did identify, I think, a handful of bills as part of a kind of a June update uh, here for the board, um, which I'll just run through pretty quickly. And if there's any questions, uh, we can get into the, into the details if, if you'd like. Um, and then with um, each of the uh, bills, uh, we do have proposed uh, letters, draft letters that would get sent to 
um, our representatives, um, again, CSAC and RCRC, as well as um, our advocacy group, uh, Sean Yoder, for distribution. Uh, so the first bill, um, which uh, RCRC in particular uh, brought to our attention, and I think it is something we need to we need to weigh in on, is AB one zero zero one. Uh, this is a measure um, that has been passed in the assembly and it is now in committee, uh, the environmental quality uh, committee, I believe in the Senate, uh, where it'll be heard tomorrow. Um, and this is a bill that actually addresses something that um, I'm personally aware of through my experience in CDD and at the airport, which has to do with CEQA and mitigation um, under, under CEQA and how you can approach it. Um, the bill, I think, has good intentions and in that it's really focused on the idea of uh, social justice. Um, whenever projects are put forward within disadvantaged communities, um, oftentimes the impacts are borne by those communities, but the, the mitigation uh, isn't. And so um, the intention is to require the mitigation to occur within a project area when it's imposed through an environmental uh, review process which again is good in terms of protecting those communities, but in places like Delmar County, what it would have the effect of would be essentially making mitigation impossible in some cases. Yep. Um, in a lot of cases, such as with the airport terminal project um, that was permitted through the California Coastal Commission, the mitigation that was identified through that permitting was allowed to occur off site because they couldn't accomplish it on site with the mitigation ratios that were imposed. So again, with this bill uh, basically requiring the mitigation to happen within the project area, it would really make a lot of those uh, sort of projects impossible. Um, I do reference uh, last chance grade in the letter as an example of where this mitigation uh, could be an issue if it's required to be on site. Um, so that's AB001. Um, it is opposed by RCRC and CSAC. And I have a letter of opposition um, in the board packet for your consideration. Uh, the second bill is AB 1717. Um, this is another uh, measure that's been introduced, passed in the assembly, is on committee in the Senate. Um, and this has to do with the definitions um, under public works projects to include um, fuel reduction. So we know that fuel reduction is gonna be a, a, a big topic, um, probably for the foreseeable future here in California with um, getting fuels out of the forest. Um, this public works um, definition being expanded would have the effect of driving up the cost of conducting those sort of activities um, through prevailing wage requirements and things like that. So this is another bill uh, where RCRC is opposed. Uh, CSAC had it in a watch position, um, but from the county's perspective with the need to do fuel reduction projects and the cost that this would um, create in conducting those projects, uh, we've suggested that a letter of opposition be uh, sub submitted. Uh, AB 1944 is another bill that is uh, passed in the assembly. It's in committee at, at the Senate. Uh, this um, was actually requested by uh, Vice Chair Short um, as a result of the city agendizing it and weighing in on it. Um, this ties into the Brown Act and public meetings and how virtual participation can be provided for through for board members and council members. Um, under AB 361, um, there were some provisions created uh, the creative little latitude for participation uh, electronically. Uh, but there were some, some strings attached. And so what this bill would do would be to create a little more latitude for participation virtually, um, and as well as uh, participation for the public. So it benefits the board members and the public. Um, it is uh, supported by RCRC and CSAC. And so we've uh, drafted just a very brief uh, letter of support um, indicating the board's support on, on AB 1944. <laughs> AB 2237. Um, is another bill that was passed in the assembly and is now in committee. Uh, this was uh, brought to our attention from uh, Ms. Layton of the Transportation Commission. Uh, she recommended uh, that the board weigh in on this. Um, I understand the, the, the Transportation Commission doesn't directly engage um, in lobby efforts on legislation, but she did uh, request that the board take this issue up. Um, this bill um, would essentially create limitations on programming of transportation projects that would create added vehicle miles traveled. 
And so as a way to address um, the vehicle miles traveled issue, uh, what we suggested in the letter, which was based on some um, RCRC and CSAC language, had to do with deferring to local uh, transportation planning processes where, the, where you can effectively accomplish the same goal, which is in reducing greenhouse gases through uh, vehicle miles traveled. So it's a, it's a fairly simple letter. Um, uh, Tamara actually did send me a more, um, I would say, robust letter um, that I'd be happy to um, swap, you know, board letterhead if the board was inclined to do that. I think in spirit and in tone, it's exactly the same. It just includes some additional details that would, you know, maybe have some uh, some weight uh, with the decision maker. So happy to send a letter that's in your board packet, or we could go with uh, the recommended letter from the Transportation Commission director if, if you're inclined to do that. Um, and then the last bill, um, which I, I'll just briefly mention because we already talked about it, um, is the care court uh, legislation. You have the letter, you just approved it. Um, I think for all the reasons that were stated, um, it's, a, it's a great uh, idea. It just needs you know, some additional consideration. So um, those are the bills we've kind of um, highlighted as, as your June uh, update focus. If there's any additional uh, bills that you guys are aware of kind of working the way through, please let me know. I'm happy to take a look at it um, and bring that back forward. Outstanding, Randy. Thank you very much. Do you have any comments from the board about Randy's presentation? Any of the letters? None. Do we have any Make public? Make a motion. Oh, oh well, thank you for that motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Good deal. Um, is there any public comment on the legislative update? update? Anybody online? I don't have any online. Thank you. Could you pull the vote then, please? Supervisor Howard? Yes. Supervisor Starkey? Yes. Supervisor Mastin? Yes. Vice Chair Short? Yes. Thank you very much. I believe we're on our last item of the day. She's nodding her head. I did it, I <laughs> I did it right. Uh, item number 35, adopt a resolution of the Delaware County Board of Supervisors committing to fund a share of the Tri-Agency Economic Development Authority debt to USDA and to and to direct staff to include $35,000 in the proposed budget as a contribution to Tri-Agency as requested by the Tri-Agency Economic Development Authority. Do we have any comments from the board on this item? Uh, you know I do. You can go right ahead. Alrighty. <laughs> um, so I noticed that we're still using the same formula as that we've used in the past. Um, when we were here in January, I believe it was Supervisor Hemmington that suggested and there was some consensus that we go back and see if we couldn't negotiate with the city and the harbor. Can you tell me, can you walk me through what happened there? When, when we entertained the idea that the city uh, yielded more benefit from the actions of the tri-agency, um, it, it was agreed, but the, the board, the majority of the board agreed that that should be applied to any uh, business that tri agency takes up in the future the past debt they didn't think was fair to change the formula um, as it applies to the past debt and that's what we're trying to do here is just pay off the, the outstanding debt so that's how that conversation went okay and just to remind me that the board is made up of two county members two city members and two harbor members yes that's correct and that board decided that we should stick with the old formulas as it is applied to the past debt yes okay that's and then has has this gone back to the city has the city um, agreed to pay their 20 percent i watch all the city council meetings but yeah, i don't I mean, recall I, seeing it but i don't i don't think they brought it up yet okay um okay so i just want to point out though that uh, i pulled the revenues and I understand you, that's what your board wants to do, but I hope you understand that me being on this board, I protect the county's interest. So I just wanna make sure I point out again that um, in TOT taxes alone, um, in the past five years, the city has out earned us by 50% in most times. Um, just TOT, they made 62% last year, we made 31%. In sales tax, they out earn us by 15%. They've made 57% more sales tax or of the total sales tax and we made 43. In total revenues over the past five years, 
they make 60% of the total revenues and we make about 38. So as a sitting board member on this for the county, I'm, I'm, I'm opposed to this breakdown of this formula. Um, my other question is um, the money that was in the bank, the 115,000 when we were here in January, that money was in the bank. What's, what's to become of that? Is that going to be paid towards the 283? I believe it's going to be um, applied to the debt. Okay, because if we do these formulas with the 62% of the county paying it, well, our share is going to be 106,000, and of the 70,000, the 10% uh, by the harbor, I think you guys said our. The formula stated. Joel, am, am I correct on that? We went back and forth so many yeah, times. Yeah, when I, my understanding from the last board meeting was that we did the calculation without including that money, um, okay. and so that's what my math here is. Is I apologize not for that. including the hundred and the about twenty thousand that's in the bank. All right, what what would become of that money? That would be future operating expenses for whatever <laughs> the agency ends up doing. Okay. In future. Um, and then in 2018, the trade agency, and I, and I forgive me if my dates are wrong, but sent that rolling load flood to the EDC. And as everybody should know, the EDC is currently under investigation. Um, if the EDC gets dissolved and somehow that money, does that money come back to us, those rolling loan funds, come back to the tri agency, I should say? There are two different agencies, so I would guess that it would not happen. Yeah, so because I believe in 2018 we told the USDA that tri agency was going to dissolve, but they didn't because we couldn't because, because we, we still had the yeah. debt exactly. So when this debt is paid, is it the intention to honor that that commitment that we're going to dissolve the tri agency? We've never told the USDA we dissolve tri agency. Okay, that's never been stated. That was a condition that they wanted to impose out of their Washington D.C. office. The California director never had such a desire to see tri-agency dissolve. They have a desire to see the debt cleared. Okay. All right. Because I read it in a letter, so I apologize. Um, I, I took it to be truthful. So USDA is expecting a proposal from us, from, from tri-agency. So, you know, we still need to make the case. And my understanding is that dissolving would not be part of that proposal. It okay. would be the intention of continuing. All right, no, uh, that's my only question, so I'd like to save my comments for after further discussion. And I appreciate you bringing those figures up, and those were presented to the Tri-Agency Board. Like, in some cases, TOT is triple in, in some quarters. Um, but that was a relatively robust discussion, and that was, you know, that was the way the, the vote went. And I, and I can appreciate that, but I, and I hope you can appreciate the fact that my role as I sit here right now is to look after the county and what's in the best interest of the county fi financially. So I hope you can appreciate no, that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I appreciate your, your efforts. Yes, Supervisor Massey. Yes, and I appreciate having that information also as far as the TOT and the sales tax because I wasn't aware of those percentages um, for recent times. Um, so I, I would have thought that would go, went into the discussions and negotiating um, the percentages that each entity were going to contribute to paying off the debt because it, it should. And um, my question would be, when was the last time that we um, had discussions with USDA and as far as the debt forgiveness or and just negotiating the um, possible reduction in that or the dropping of the interest that was owed um, since the time that we defaulted. So I'd appreciate um, those. We made an application to Tri-Agency in the fall of 2020 um, to give them what Tri-Agency had, which at that point I think was about 134000 and um, asking that the rest be forgiven. They uh, said no. Uh, since then, I have been in contact, fairly regular contact with their regional rep, and um, 
I, I floated this idea that we pay in full, but on a five-year plan with the interest not in accruing. Um, he checked with the national office. They said that's um, likely to be approved if Tri-NC has dedicated funding streams from each member agency. That the point of the, of the resolution is to kind of create that package. Um, Dan Johnson just emailed me the other day asking, hey, where are we? Because the national office is asking. They, they um, seem like they really want to do this this time. This has always kind of been an impediment. They haven't really been interested in the compromise, but this one seems like it might be a go. It's my understanding that occasion back in 2020, we sent them a check. We did. They just didn't respond. The check never went anywhere. It, it died on their desk. But there had been multiple... I mean, you asked for the most recent time, yes, but there's been so many times we've attempted to. Uh, yeah. It's always a new day, though, <laughs> and I have found that to be true. Um, I know we had to do, um, when I was with the tribe, some negotiations with USDA over a revolving loan fund that um, was defaulted in, and there was some leeway that was made there for some debt forgiveness, and so that's why I was curious as to what um, we had learned in most recently um, they, when they those have, discussions occurred. They last time said yes they would do the compromise if Tridency ceased to exist but then they said that they would take that remaining unpaid debt and send it to the Treasury for collections which is kind of like a link situation like well no one's going to enforce it but it'll be there on the books and Tridency's JPA says we can't dissolve with debt so it just kind of puts us in this loop where the debt would still exist and therefore we can't dissolve and therefore we can't meet the conditions of the compromise. Um, that's kind of in this frustrating circle that we've been in, um, you know, mostly since 2015, I think was the first offer. This is the third or fourth that we've been through now. Because that would have some concerns for me and um, analyzing and taking a look of and given I do not have all of the information, I've only have what's been provided uh, most recently to me. But I would have great concerns over um, having the tri-agency be uh, functioning at this time and um, simply because of I didn't see a lot of success in its 50 years of existence um, to merit that they sh we should continue to um, have the organization exist the way that it is presented now with um, how they operate and how we measure their successes. Um, so th those are my concerns at this point and um, I don't know where you're at. I guess you just had these discussions with the city and the harbor at a meeting where you talked about the percentages that each of us, each of us would be paying towards the debt. That was a recent discussion that occurred. That's the, yeah, it's a discussion that's gone on for the last Six or eight meetings. <laughs> so um, I guess I'm I'm really struggling with this to see justification of um, so what's before us. So I'm I mean, I'm going to hear other. Yeah. If uh, if yep. yeah, if I may, and I understand uh, Supervisor Mastin's concerns expressed. Um, obviously, the debt occurred long before any of us had a twinkle in our eye about becoming a supervisor in this county. The debt occurred under previous tri-agency boards. And again, they, we, I should say, the tri-agency were a lender of last resort. That's how that revolving loan functioned, as a lender of last resort. Unfortunately, some of the earlier loans that tri-agency made were not collateralized. And tri-agency, when those loans defaulted, was left holding the bag. We're now in a position and have been essentially since tri-agency went into default to pay back as a member agency that debt to the USDA. We've worked creatively and collaboratively on this, me in particular since 2015, to find a negotiated way to do it. But there's been literally no willingness on a national level with my several trips to DC to have that debt dissolved even though there's language within the congressional docket that allows for that to occur as very well uh, lined out in multiple letters to USDA by uh, Joel Campbell Blair's predecessor, Elizabeth. So we've done everything we can, but today 
before us on this agenda is literally to address the debt. And I appreciate Supervisor Starkey's concerns with how the debt is split up between the member agencies. I'm not sure we're going to be able to quench those concerns today because each member agency, as stated in our last agency meeting, really feels that we should stay with the previous formula that'll, that allowed for those allocations to occur. So our contribution to resolve this debt as, as we are negotiating with USDA to dissolve these debts over a five-year period, um, our contribution would be in that 35000 and change range per year for the next five years. So I guess what I'm trying to um, gauge, uh, Supervisor Mastin, is that with your current level of knowledge on this subject, um, do you need more time to talk about this? And I would say yes, and I would like to see yes, because I don't want to improve this debt plan and think that tri-agency is going to be in existence during those five years and that there is X amount of money in the bank that could go towards the debt. And so I, would, I want the time for clarification on um, tri-agency and what tri-agency is going to be able to do in that five-year time span um, of operation during this repayment. And does it make sense to, um, and do we have funds to pay it off up front and dissolve the agency? So that's what I need to know more so about at in least, order to. Yeah, and at least what I'm hearing from you right now is that you have a belief based on your current knowledge of tri-agency that it should be dissolved. And you've expressed on the dais here today that you believe they've done nothing for this community over the last 50 years. I would beg of you to at least do some research about what they have done because the majority of the position we have been placed here economically within Delaware County, a lot of those efforts were led by that agency. So um, I, I know this is not the topic for our agenda today. It's literally mm -hmm. basically taking care of this debt service so the agency could function, but we as a Board of Supervisors, at maybe at a future time, for your edification, could at least discuss the previous role tri agency played in economic development in this community and the role that they'd like to get back to playing if we're not going to have an economic development arm in this community, which is desperately needed yes. and, more importantly, a focus of any government organization. And I agree, and that's one of my priorities is economic development for this county and appropriate economic development with, um, with some clear, clear ideas about where we're going. And so I, don't, I'm, I just want for us to take a look at this. And if you have something other than what I have knowledge of, yes, I want to hear what that is. And yes, please provide it to me yep. because um, what I have before me now does not support um, it and so I I know the importance of economic development. It's a number one concern for me as a supervisor, and so um, I I am in, you know in favor of that. So I just am not prepared for this discussion and need to understand clearly what the role of the tri agency would be in those five years and what could look different about how that organization is set up so that um, we feel comfortable that, you know, as they move forward, we're not in the same situation. Fair enough. Well, I think with that, um, obviously seeing that there's four of us on the dais and uh, we're not going to come to a consensus, um, I think we'll table this item for a later agenda. And, uh, and with that, I believe um, that will end this meeting. Is that this was, this was the last one. Do we have any public comment? Uh, thank you, Supervisor Howard. Do we have any public comment on item number, well, it's not an action item, but go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, on item 35. Thank you, ladies. Seems like you understand what it means to hold the money in the purse, okay? Because these gentlemen here, I do not understand why taxpayers have to pay that debt that they did not create. The people that created it aren't held accountable or responsible. 
No. And she is right to say that this is a failed agency for 25, 50 years. The paperwork supports that. It's a failed agency because nobody that was sitting down there wherever that place was knew what they were doing and they were called on it. So it's not ever going to change. Never going to change. Let it go. What is the Del Norte Economic Development Corporation? What is that? Is that not for uh, getting jobs created? Or does it have to be just the Tri Agency? Because you guys, you guys are failures in that department. And I don't understand how come you're allowed to vote on it, because I would think that's a conflict, that you sit on the Tri Agency. Of course you want the Tri Agency. Anyway, no, uh, thank you. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Valerie, for caring about the money. We're, we're at the beginning of a major recession, none that we've never, ever experienced in our lifetime. And when the heartland reaches $5 a gallon for gas, it's only a matter of time for this country to shut down. And it's shutting down fast. And I don't think, I think you should hold on to that money. I don't think you should be pissing it away on a tri-agency that's never proven to be functional to begin with. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Supervisors. My name is Kevin Bingham. I'm the owner of Glenn's Bakery. I stand here before you today a victim of the Del Norte Economic Development Corporation's unscrupulous practices. I've been eight years and almost a million dollars in my own home sold to pay back my loan to them in less than two years time of obtaining it. Their unscrupulous, malfeasant, conflicted business practices put me in the position of abject poverty at which time I obtained a cottage permit from the county and started selling cookies on a card table. Did over $120,000 gross last year on a card table. I blew the whistle in 2019 to the federal government when I contacted the Office of Inspector General. Since then, there's been over a three-year investigation by the federal government on the Del Norte Economic Development Corporation. This investigation, still ongoing by the USDA, involves the Department of Treasury, EDA, Economic Development Agency. There's a lot of alphabets in there. Economic Development Agency is a subsidiary Department of Treasury, separate than the USDA. Both have rural development arms, lending to nonprofit lenders to be relended to entrepreneurs like myself. The DNADC has lost over a million dollar loan fund revoked by you, uh, by the Department of Treasury, Office of Inspector General, due to my complaint, the conf conflict of interest on the board regarding my loan and their malfeasant business practices. Now the, suspo the supposed disbanded tri-agency which in my hundreds of hours of communication with special agents from the Office of Inspector General, thousands of documents exchanged between the federal government and myself, were all amazed that the tri-agency was still even talked about. They were under the impression it had been disbanded long ago and were surprised to hear that they were still accepting payments. Excuse my voice, I have a, a wounded um, vocal cord. The federal investigation has also been looking at tri-agency ongoing and certain members of the community that end, for lack of a better, wor better word, are lobbying for the tri-agency to be rebirthed. Supervisors who sit on the board of the tri-agency are now voting to pay off private individuals' debt in hopes of getting more federal funding this is another major of conflict of interest, and I hear that county council feels otherwise. Interestingly, 
Autumn Luna, of, that was formerly counsel for GNEDC, felt that my conflict of interest was also non-existent. Federal investigators found otherwise. Why should taxpayers pay off private debt? Where will this end? Are you going to pay off my USDA loan? I owe $48,000 that is under investigation now. Are you willing to pay off mine? Where is that going to end? This action will place Del Norte County in a position of liability. These sources of funding, you say you need an economic development branch, these sources are already available at no cost to the county, no cost for legal, no cost for staffing through the Arcadia Economic Development Corporation that I have a very close relationship with. They have the same sources, USDA, EDA, Department of Treasury, and a host of other sources of funding for entrepreneurs that are earmarked only for Del Norte County. They have a full-time office here now in the uh, SBDC location. Funding, and they've already funded several loans here. So why duplicate those sources of funding when it's going to cost us taxpayers' money? That 100000 should be paid towards the debt that's existing. And why should we pay to staff an office to duplicate sources that are already available for free? to entrepreneurs here in Del Norte County. Excuse my exuberance, but it's, it's been eight years of hell for me. Hell. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Why would they treat me so poorly when I had paid off most of my loan in two years' time? Come to find out one of the board members was in a huge conflict of interest and killed my project. As to quote um, Frank Westbecker of EDA, it is obvious to the federal government what happened to me. Good this makes me your, your time expired. Please wrap it up. This makes me question why certain individuals want to rebirth this previously funked tri agency, which was a predecessor of the Economic Development yeah, Agency. Anyway, I feel this is going to put the county in the crosshairs of this ongoing federal investigation. I figure like I feel that it's it's a uh, a wrong use of funds, and I feel like that this needs to be put to bed. This malfeasance, this uh, unethical business practices using federal dollars needs to be put to bed and use another group, the Arcata group, that is an honest above board group, not to imply any wrongdoing on the supervisors here. You weren't even involved then with the tri-agency, I don't believe. But in my, I am a victim standing before you, and I speak out in fear of retaliation here today. My investigation is still ongoing. So I thank you so much for hearing me. God bless you and thank you for your time. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Vice Chair, I do have somebody online. Very good, thank you. Brandon, you are on. Hello, yes, uh, another discussion that's been ongoing. Um, and no one wants to take accountability. Of course, we have to pay our debts, but it's easy to pay a debt when you use other people's money. I wish we had this discussion more lively about how we spend money and spend tax dollars. Um, you know, and I was disheartened when Supervisor Howard was critical of Ms. Maston and thinking that you do or don't know what she knows. She's very arrogant. Sorry to see that in our leadership. Um, you've been overseeing this loan for quite a while and nothing's happened. Almost sounds like you've spent more money looking into it than actually fixing it. So I'd just like to see government work for the people, not government work for more government. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for your comments. Vice Chair, that was it. That was it. Any other public comments from anyone? Mr. Chairman, I just have to Roger respond. Howard, go right ahead. Yes, you're right. I have been looking into fixing this more than I've actually been looking to do solid economic development work here in this county. That's all I've done is focus on relieving this debt service. Since 2015, relieving this debt. Yes, there are previous board members. I wasn't on that board. You weren't on that board, Valerie, Sue, you guys weren't on that board. But those loans were made, they were committed to by the tri-agency and backed. 
We were a member agency of that. I'd like to get back to the business of economic development in Delnor County. Most importantly, this agency was set up to do that as a member agency of the city, the county, and the harbor. It is not with EDC, the Delnor Economic Development Committee. It's not. We're not anything to do with that. I want to be clear. What the last presentation you heard, there's no relationship there. We are trying to clear up tri agencies piece of this, and hopefully someday we'll get to the point where we can clear up tri agencies piece of this as a lender of last resort through the USDA's result, revolving loan fund, which in this case, business owners, entrepreneurs took the risk, similar to what you just heard, took the risk. Tri agency was willing to back that risk with federal dollars. There was a program in place to relieve that debt but the feds didn't want to let it go. In this case, our county and our member agencies are left holding the bag. So hopefully someday we could get to the point, once the facts are out there, to relieve this debt as one of the member agencies of Tri Agency. Well, if I could, Chair. Go right ahead, um, So there, there is that investigation that, that is unrelated to the tri agency but I think maybe we should just wait until that investigation comes out and is concluded to make sure that there is no um, crossover or lingering information so perhaps we need to wait until that investigation is concluded in my talks with OIG um, there is no uh, there is no correlation with EDC and tri agency and as the tri agency was not being considered as any well, subject and, or any And that's interesting because when I've talked with the OIG, they can't give any information because it's a pending report. I mean, and I, because I asked for a FOIA, I'm sorry, <laughs> but I did. I don't know. So. I, I talked to the investigator. <laughs> I asked him specifically. He said that there's no interest, there's no investigation of tri agency. We're not involved. It's a different program. It has nothing to do with tri agency. Now, if it became, I mean, if something different happened afterwards, you know, I don't know, but uh, tri agency was in no way involved in that loan program. It's, again, and we'll revisit this. Thank you for tabling uh, this for another discussion, Chair. But again, we do have a willing partner with USDA to help us figure out how to settle this debt. Hopefully, we'll consider that in the future. And if you could get the, the city and the harbor to pony up their share, I think that would be the best. The, the harbor is already committed. And with that, I will adjourn this meeting till our next regular meeting, June 28, 2022.